All right, so Bart Key's trying to convey the idea that there is another kind of oppression that we need to attend to, and that's psychological oppression. She's not trying to discount the importance of discussions like Marilyn Fry's and uh, other discussions that focus on the economic and political aspects of oppression. Those are certainly really important, but what Barkey's trying to uncover in this essay is that there's another element, there's another aspect, there's another mode of, of oppression that is actually quite harmful, and identifying it can be helpful to persons who are oppressed in this way to identify those kinds of oppressions and learn to understand more about their own identity, more about their own agency and autonomy, and thus have a means of liberation from these kinds of oppressions that are psychological and that cause fragmentation and that cause internalization of stereotypes. So she's giving us this account, which ought to be helpful to us in different ways. Bartke is basing this account off of France Fanon's account in Black Skin, White Masks, and she is explaining the ways in which gender oppression causes experiences of these three kinds of psychological oppression, stereotyping, cultural domination, and sexual objectification. We will look at each of those a little bit more closely so that we understand what she means by each of those three kinds of psychological oppression, and we'll try to understand what Bartke means by fragmentation and what Bartke means by mystification, because these are all things that are going to be major themes in many of the readings that we'll do in this course. So we want to get clear from the outset on what we're talking about when we're talking about fragmentation and what we're talking about when we're talking about mystification. Uh, let's start with stereotyping, though. So this, this first kind or mode of, of psychological oppression uh, is stereotyping, and as Bartke says, stereotyping prevents others from knowing and understanding my needs as a person, as a human being, as an agent, as a self. And that prevention of being understood by others contributes to my internalizations and, and beliefs in the stereotype uh, that I am being sort of grouped in. And that kind of stereotyping prevents and undermines self-actualization, autonomy, and self-determination. So autonomy and agency. Now, we want to understand how fragmentation is related to stereotyping in particular. And so remember that fragmentation is the splitting of the whole person into parts of a person. When you use stereotyping, you take one aspect, whether it be a visible identity marker or something that's not visible but it's a practice or some aspect of a person's being, that you take and you allow that to stand for the person in their entirety. We are all very complex beings, but stereotyping sort of picks out one aspect of a person or a group's being and allows that aspect of their being to stand for, to represent who they are as a person, uh, undermining their complexity, undermining their agency and autonomy, right? So since fragmentation is this means of splitting a person into various parts, where one part becomes salient, more salient than other parts, fragmentation through stereotyping causes us to see ourselves in a very non-unified way. We see ourselves sometimes as weak, yet at the same time we think we're strong. We see ourselves as dependent, yet sometimes we feel independent, because we, we come to know ourselves more and more by the stereotypes that are applied to us, and this causes a kind of cognitive dissonance in how we understand ourselves. And the way that mystification works in stereotyping is that we experience and struggle against stereotypes that are mystified, that is, they're obscured. So remember that mystification is the systematic obscuring of reality and agency through psychological oppression. And that systematic obscuring of reality causes a depreciation of the self. And that depreciation of the self is lived out as a sense of destiny, as a sense of guilt or neurosis or inferiority or maladjustment. So what's actually 
structural and systemic becomes a kind of self-ascription, a self-ascription of, of guilt or inferiority. Given that mystification is the obscuring or the making invisible of systematic forces at play that have an effect on individual persons, the way that mystification is important in stereotyping is that in stereotyping we experience and struggle against the kind of stereotypes that become mystified and obscured. We then believe ourselves to be insecure, inferior, neurotic, immature, maladjusted, because the systematicity of the effects of psychological oppression are hidden. And remember, this was Fry's point when she talked about the ways in which we have to take a macroscopic perspective in order to see the systematicity of oppression. This applies to Bartke's account as well, because those, those wires of the birdcage, those barriers, those networks and systems of oppression become mystified, and we don't see them as obstacles of oppression. We don't see them as networks of oppression at all. In fact, we don't see the oppression. We don't see the forces because they become obscured. They become naturalized in such a way that we just accept that that's just how things are. So if you're thinking about gender roles or stereotypes that we have against different racial groups or ethnic groups, different genders for sure, you know, you can think and say, well, well, you know, you, you're just being all crazy women's liver. But the fact is, is that the, the systematicity of these kinds of networks and systems do cause political, economic, and psychological oppression. And so mystification is a way that society works to make those forces invisible so that they, they are not recognized as oppressive, but just as the way the world is, when in fact that's not just the way the world is. Those are purposefully constructed systems oppressing people. Okay, let's look at cultural domination, the second type or kind or mode of psychological oppression that Bartke talks about. And in cultural domination, Bartke wants to explain that what happens is that women don't really have a culture of their own. The group women is a bit different than other oppressed groups, whether it be racial groups, ethnic groups, or even age groups, groups based on sexuality, women don't tend to have a separate culture of their own, right? Like black culture, gay culture, Jewish culture, etc. There's not really a women's culture. The culture of our men just is our culture. Women tend to be aligned with their men rather than with other women. Women have no cultural autonomy. Our culture is the culture of men, and it's a culture that's saturated in sexism. The way that fragmentation figures into cultural domination is that because we're both part of, yet not part of culture, I must be myself, yet be a universal subject. And this is very difficult to do. I mean, even if you just think about the language, whether it be literature, religious texts, fiction, philosophy, if you look back at the way that language has been used in the past, at least in the English language, we use the word men to represent people. There's this kind of notion of a universal subject. Yet, there's this sense that when we talk about people, we're talking about everyone, but at the same time, we don't see everyone represented in the books that we read, in the movies that we watch, in the music that we listen to. The culture itself has historically been very male-dominated, and for that reason, at least sexist and many times misogynist. So women are both part of culture because we are persons, but we're not really full persons. So we're not really fully a part of culture, and we're not part of cultural production think about it, how many, how many artists do you know? If you like art, how many artists can you name? Name five artists. Magritte, Dali, Picasso, Monet, Monet. It's pretty easy to name artists. But how many female artists can you name? 
maybe Frida Kahlo, perhaps Georgia O'Keeffe. There just aren't as many female artists as there are male artists. It's similar in literature. I mean, how many great American writers can you name? How many of those are women? Uh, how many presidents can you name? How many U.S. presidents can you name? And how many of those are women? None. There's a sense in which the culture in which we live has simply been male culture. And for that reason, women are fragmented beings, according to Barkey. We're part of culture, yet we're not really part of culture. I should be myself, yet I should also be a universal subject. And a universal subject is this rational subject who is, is just kind of like a placeholder, all the same. But I don't find myself to be the same as any other subject. And the ways in which I'm different aren't represented in culture. All right, so let's talk about the third, the, the, the third kind of psychological oppression, sexual objectification. The sexual parts or functions are separated from one's person and personality, and I'm reduced to the status of a body part or a body, bodily function through compulsive sexualization. The way that fragmentation is related to sexual objectification is that in splitting a person into parts, it forces a kind of coerced identification of a person as a body part. Bartke tells the story of a friend or colleague who goes on an interview for a job in philosophy, and this is very prevalent in philosophy and probably other disciplines as well, and she, gets, she shows up for the interview, and her interviewer is male, of course, he's the head of the department, and he's male, and he stares at her breast the entire time. And obviously she doesn't get the job, she probably doesn't perform well, because the entire interview, she's aware that he's staring at her breasts. He's not listening to what she's saying. He's not relating to her as a philosopher. He's relating to her as a sexual object. And when women are constantly sexually objectified, and we are, we become aware of this objectification and it kind of forces us to attend to the fact that we're being sexually objectified. It takes our energy and our attention away from doing other things. So although we might try to be a philosopher or a writer or a nurse or uh, a teacher, we have to spend a lot of energy and attention understanding that we are being fragmented into different parts. And one of the salient parts that's being recognized by other people, particularly by men, is the way in which we are seen as sexual objects. This fragmentation through sexual objectification forces a kind of coerced identification of a person as a body, and we can internalize that. And quite frankly, it's draining. And it causes us to pay more attention to things like our weight, beauty products, beauty standards, the amount of time and energy that women put into being sexual objects because they're aware that they're sexually objectified is completely mind-blowing. The fact that we have to constantly be aware of our weight and who's looking at us and what we're wearing. Not only is this cause fragmentation, it also involves a kind of mystification. So. The fact that, that sexual objectification is a naturalized part of life in this society becomes mystified. It comes to seem just like that's the way things are, right? So remember, mystification is this obscuring or making invisible of the, the systems and forces at play. And so the obscuring of comp compulsive sexualization causes a kind of internalism of this kind of oppression as a neurotic focus on body size, a neurotic focus on beauty standards, and also an identification with the self as a sexual object. And this is really, really problematic because it keeps women from doing other things that they could be doing in terms of self-actualization and creative activities. 
becoming the people that they want to be. Okay, so we might ask how Bartke's account is different from Fry's account. Although there are some similarities in these two accounts, Bartke is using a distinct kind of methodology here. So rather than looking for and identifying the necessary and sufficient conditions for oppression, which is what Fry did, if you remember, Fry argued that the three necessary and sufficient conditions were that oppression is systematic and had to be identified from a macroscopic perspective, that only persons who are members of a particular group that is targeted are qualify as being oppressed, and that persons who are oppressed have a distinct relationship to the barrier. Right? So these are necessary and sufficient conditions of oppression, according to Fry. But Barkey's taking a different kind of approach. She's not looking for necessary and sufficient conditions approach. She's not saying if you meet these conditions, you're oppressed. If you don't meet these conditions, you're not oppressed. She's allowing us to, through a phenomenological approach, she's allowing us to look at her experience of oppression and to see if we can identify with what she's talking about. She's saying, hey, look, it, it, it seems to me through my life experiences that oppression can be psychological and that there's something important that we can do in identifying these aspects of psychological oppression. We can learn more about ourselves in our world. We can maybe open up some space for greater agency, uh, for greater self-actualization. If we can identify the ways in which stereotyping, cultural domination, and sexual objectification affect our lives as women. However, she doesn't want to lump all women together in one group in the way that Fry does. Barkey is saying, look, everyone's probably going to experience this differently. The, the amount and kind of sexual objectification you experience is going to vary depending on many things, including your age, your race, your ethnicity, your sexuality, etc. But it is likely that all women experience sexual objectification, although they don't experience sexual objectification in the, in the same way. Uh, same thing with cultural domination and stereotyping. This account serves to give us tools so that we can use these tools, these concepts, to recognize the ways in which these things affect us personally, individually, and illuminate the effects of psychological oppression in our lives so that we can attend to those effects and minimize the effects, the negative effects of psychological oppression, use our time and resources to shape our own identities and become the kinds of beings that we want to be rather than to allow systems of oppression to completely shape us. Please watch the next 10 minutes. I'm going to add a video that should really illuminate the, the depth to which psychological oppression, particularly through stereotyping, cultural domination, and sexual objectification, although this video is not really going to emphasize sexual objectification because it's looking at race, but I think you'll be able to see the ways in which that's a parallel. But the ways in which we as human beings internalize we internalize things like stereotypes and objectification and cultural domination in such a way that it shapes us to a great, great degree. If you haven't seen this video before, it's a video of an experiment called the Clark Experiment, and it was redone by an undergraduate student in the 2000s, I believe, and it really reveals the extent to which at a very young age, we're already internalizing what society is saying about us. Please, please watch this and think about the ways in which this video exemplifies the kinds of things that Bartke was trying to say in her analysis. Which doll is the black doll? And which one is the white doll? Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? 
And which doll is the bad doll? And, what, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Like me? Yeah, which one looks like you? Um, that one. Every black female has a big butt and big boobs. Loud, obnoxious. You get them. Light skin being more attractive than dark skin. We're not smart. We're this way, we're that way. And a lot of times we have to prove ourselves as not being true. At a young age, I already knew the standards for a girl like me. As I become older, they become more obvious. You have to have permed hair, relaxed hair. You know, straight hair or like blonde hair, you know, long weaves or something. And if it's natural, that's even, that's, that's good hair. Like bad hair is hair you have to relax because it's kinky. Like it's not like a pale and a half, like natural hairstyles. Or like if they are natural, they have to be like the curly head, like black girl or something that looks mixed or something. And I remember when I first started wearing my hair natural, at first my mom was okay with it. And she, she thought it, it looked nice. And then after like the second day, she was like, oh, stop that. She was like, you're starting to look African. I was like, well, I am African. And that really pissed me off. There are standards that are imposed upon us. Like, um, you know, you're pretty, you're prettier if you're light skinned. I knew people in the past that like, just like, wanted to be light-skinned, not for any particular reason, you know, because they love themselves. I mean, they, they love themselves except for, you know, the color of their skin. Hey, my siblings are all lighter than me, and my um, my mom, she's dark-skinned, but she's lighter than me. So, like, I noticed, and I was like, hey, how come I'm the darkest? And, you know, everybody else is so light, and I don't know. Since I was younger, I, I also considered being lighter as a form of beauty or, you know, beautiful more that you know beautiful than being dark-skinned so I used to think of myself as being ugly because I was dark-skinned I knew people who actually like went out there and got you know bleaching cream and everything they actually like you like laid in the tub like poured like capsules of bleach into it just so they could like see if their skin would get lighter but yeah my aunt that lives in Honduras she basically started using skin bleaching cream when she was about 25 and she started her oldest daughter on it when she was about 11. And then she has an even younger daughter that was about six when she started using the skin bleaching cream on her. I've seen people say that I would never marry a dark-skinned man because, you know, because I don't want that in my gene pool. On the other hand, light-skinned girls have their issues too. We've been called high yellow, conceited house nigga. I feel like both sides have their issues. I guess I sort of felt like I, there was not any attention towards me because of maybe my skin color or because my hair was kinky or, you know, just basically that. Or even when, also when I was younger, like, say there was, there was, I don't know, a doll. I used to have a lot of dolls, but most of them were just white dolls with long straight hair that I would comb and I would be like, oh, I wish I was just like this Barbie doll. In Brown v. Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. 
He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you liked best or that you'd like to play with? Show me the doll that is the nice doll. And why is that the nice doll? She's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give... And why does that look bad? Because it's black. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Fifteen out of the twenty-one children preferred the white doll. Our ancestors came to, the, to this country and they were pretty much ripped, ripped out of their culture. You know, they couldn't speak their language. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't be themselves. They had to be like, like what everybody else told them to be. When you don't know where you're from, and you don't know what country you're from, all you know is basically you're from Africa. That's all you're given. I feel like it brings on like a lot of ignorance, and it it builds a lot of anger. I've seen like I've seen it build a lot of anger in a lot of black young females. Like I don't know, they feel like. Because they like they feel like they have a right to disown any kind of you know African roots. I think for a black girl in general, it's like you're missing a piece of you, you know. And for me, yeah, it's like oh, I, I don't have any any actual heritage, not heritage, but culture. Like I know I'm I'm from Africa, but you know, different, the different countries in Africa have their different cultures, their different morals, their different values. And not knowing that it just, it, it sort of keeps us at a loss. And we just, I feel like we're busy searching for it while everybody else in society is throwing their ideas and what they believe we should be at us. But, you know, personally, we know that's not what we should be, but we're going to take it because we ha we don't know exactly what it is that we should be because we don't really know where we came from.